protect our little fictions Like it's all we are Little wilderness memento But there's only you and me here Yorkshire, England Two senior Ruby developers are sitting down to lunch over a meat pie. That's just trouble, isn't it? Aye. Josiah and Obadiah are senior software engineers exchanging views. <laughs> Juniors, half the time I feel like saying, let me Google that for you. They've clearly had a difficult morning. It's not like they don't have that stack overflow. We never had that when we were lads. We used to have to go back to first principles and work it out on our own. That's the thing though, tint it. We had three years of proper education before we worked on out. Aye, boot camps are great and all, but without a proper understanding of fundamentals, they're just going to struggle with real work. And they have all these newfangled frameworks. Luxury! When I got this job, I had to do a four-hour algorithm interview using only a pencil. Aye. How do they slide into their cushy jobs now? An hour of pairing on real computer. Madness. How are they going to survive the cut and thrust of the modern workspace? I had to write binary by hand for 12 hours before they'd even look at my CV. Don't even get me started on their fancy editors. VS Code, for heaven's sake. Atom. Sublime. Even flipping text, mate. You can't hear it on the audio, but they then perform a secret handshake known only to the masters of Vim. So the Latin translation of the name of our species, Homo sapiens, is wise man. It seems a little egotistical to me. Um, but is this really true? I'm not seeing a great deal of wisdom from the leaders of either of our two countries. Is it true of the people who put this sign on this gate? <laughs> is it true of software engineers? Now in the righteous mind, Jonathan Haidt introduces a metaphor for the human mind. This is what you think of as you, the conscious mind with its rational functions and volitional power. This is your emotions. Does anyone want to guess who's really in control? Our reasoning process has become brilliant at the task of justifying our latent intuitions. Like we believe we seek objective truth like scientists, but our rational minds are actually more like PR consultants. Um, it's hard to turn an elephant when it has decided where it's going. It is easier for the rider to just pretend that's the direction they wanted to go in the first place. Luigi has been asked to fix a bug by a senior engineer. He's new to the team and just coming up to speed. Hey, I was wondering if I could get your review and merge on this quick fix you asked me to do. <sighs> sure. But then nurturing a little residual annoyance after Luigi's questions held back their PR from a couple of days ago. All right, let's get stuck in here. He's looking through the code. It's actually a decent PR, like 700 lines long. It's a quick, useful fix with some changes to view code that solves an immediate bug. It's not perfect by any means, and it could have shipped smaller. Hmm. They've written tests, and CI is green, but I wouldn't have taken this approach. Aha! There's a typo in one of the test descriptions, and some extra spaces. So, what do you think? Not as it is. You asked me to keep an eye on your PR size and quality, and this one needs some work. There's a typo in the commit message, and you've left some white space behind. Our hero fixes and resubmits the PR. What should we do now? Uh, and all that remains is a comment. I'm going to need some very good justification for organizing the code the way it is in this change. This feels very much like it should be done in a different way to me. So it's time I introduce myself. Uh, I'm Andy. Uh, I'm the small one on the right. Um, I work at a company called Coverage Book in the UK. Um, I run a little conference, which is now into its sixth year in Brighton. Um, and I also run a little newsletter with a little bit of Ruby every, Monday, every other Monday morning, although I've been a bit slack the last month writing this. So let's talk about what we do. You know this metal rectangle full of little lights? Yeah. I spend most of my life pressing buttons to make the pattern of lights change however I want. Sounds good. 
But today the pattern of lights is all wrong. Try pressing more buttons. It's not helping. <laughs> this is our job. And mostly in our case, the rectangle is in someone else's hand and we've never even seen it. We are really clever. For many of us, the direct control of the rectangle is what drew us to the career in the first place. I did a degree in computer science. I was good at programming, logic puzzles, unpicking problems, although undergraduate mathematics did remain a total mystery. I was a mixture of confused and perhaps a bit arrogant about the workloads of my friends with their degrees in the humanities, geography, history, psychology. After the degree, I found myself working at a company called Accenture, which is a massive enterprise technology company, although they would define themselves in a much more oblique and impenetrable airport poster way. I thought I was going to use my newly earned coding prowess to solve problems. But although I was sold that when I took the job, I spent the next four years doing HR and communications. I interviewed people with 25 years experience as my team arrived to make loads of people redundant. I ran large multi-platform education programs, massive organizational change, celebration events with keynote speakers, trying to anticipate the questions that we would have and answer them clearly and crisply. I eventually left for the siren call of a handsome Danish gentleman, <laughs> talking about making a blog in 15 minutes with an esoteric Japanese programming language. I was drawn back to this world of control where I could hack away at my keyboard without the pressure of all this people stuff, safe knowing I could cocoon, my, cocoon myself away with the code and just make awesome stuff. Oscar is the senior engineer in his team and has decided to maintain the code quality by reviewing every single PR. Nadia is relatively new in the job and a bit nervous. Oscar is known to be a bit of a handful before they've had their morning coffee. I've left it a couple of hours. Oscar's come out of a meeting a few minutes ago, so she shouldn't be too deep in something. They approach stealthily. Uh, hi there, Oscar. Could you? The world pauses. It seems to freeze on its, ax on its axis as Oscar fixes Nadia with a glare. How dare you? Everyone knows that I'm not to be disturbed when I'm thinking. My job is to solve incredibly complex architectural problems. Don't you realize you've obliterated my mental stack? Now I'm going to have to start building this entire feature again. Oscar takes the piece of paper they were reading and ostentatiously throws it in the bin. But the name of this talk is The Games Developers Play and not Andy's Amateur Radio Hour. It turns out this talk's actually about psychology or more accurately, an area of psychology called transactional analysis. This book was written in 1957, and it's not a self-help book, it's the, one of the origin texts for this kind of psychotherapy. It pioneered a way of talking about it without flowery language and with a focus on practical application. You could say it shares a worldview with our favorite programming language. So the central conceit is that we inhabit, bleh. so the central conceit is that we inhabit one of three psychological realities. Parent, adult, and child. In many interactions in our lives and relationships, we end up in one of these three states. They aren't permanent states of being, they are psychological realities that we temporarily experience. For whatever reason, we might find ourselves as a parent, which can be both controlling, scolding persona, as well as a caring, nurturing one. Which is broadly a reality we are taught from outside ourselves as kids. And we might, in times of stress, fall back on these models of behavior. Child in the model does not mean adorable sleep terrorist. It just represents a more internally focused reality, more based on how you feel when things happen to you. It's often playful and full of joy, but it's ill-disciplined and quick to anger. And completing the familial model is adult. You can't just lose the parent and child, and nor would you want to, but instead of letting them run riot, the idea is that your adult is the arbiter of the usefulness of their input. Now, whilst we're talking about the foundations of transactional analysis, we should also talk about the drama triangle. This is Stephen Cartman, who studied under Eric Byrne. His concept of the drama triangle is another useful way to think about communication with each other. It's an alternative set of roles that can be examined alongside parent, adult, child. In this model, competition for the coveted victim role keeps the drama happening and the emotions flowing unchecked. You know, by achieving the victim role, you either end up blaming others or yourself for your current situation, which is where the emotional payoff comes from. 
In Burns' book, there were 36 games. These games tended not to be deliberately invoked, but fall out of the emotional needs of the players. Now, they run the whole gamut from full-life games like Alcoholic, or games played primarily in romantic relationships like Sweetheart. But the main thing I think you'll note is that Dr. Byrne was a psychologist with a sense of humor. And he very much like a programmer, reveled in the importance of naming things properly. Now, your first instinct might be to look at these roles and get stuck on the terminology. They can be potentially difficult if you use them as permanent labels. The idea you might play the victim or be childish could be quite damning. But they're not intended that way. They're temporary psychological realities, not things you are or roles that you play permanently. Although we best understand these models in terms of the roles, the field is transactional analysis. The most important parts are the transitions between the roles and the communications between the participants. Now, you're probably thinking, those are some nice circles, Andy. Thanks so much. But what does it have to do with me? Well, George Box wisely said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So with that in mind, let's go back and take a look at some of our overheard conversations. So the main game being played between our hero and the scary turtle dinosaur is now I've got you, you son of a bitch. Now here, the dynamic is the punitive reviewer holding the child to ransom with their emotive distaste, when the simplest thing would just be to ship the finished code. The parent's determination to be in charge is hamstringing the whole forward momentum of the product. Incidentally, this is a comment I received for real. Slightly paraphrased. So my specific issue with this comment was that although evidence was required to move forward with the code, the only evidence against was the emotional feelings of the reviewer. This is a clear sign that games were accidentally being played. Now, the main game between Oscar and Nadia is, now look what you made me do. Oscar has used his parental seniority to enforce review of all the code, because games don't have to be negative. Borrowing someone else's parent can be a positive thing, you know, assisting your self-control. In this case, however, Nadia approaches as an adult, but Oscar's punitive parent leaves her told off, scolded, and vulnerable. It's quite a similar pattern to Now I've Got You. Nadia's nervousness shows that this is a game that Oscar plays regularly. Another feature of games is their repetitive nature. Then, Oscar gets to play his favorite game, Uproar. Oscar's petulant child is given free and righteous reign to kick off. How dare you? Exactly. So what's going on if we examine this, trans this interaction through the prism of the drama triangle? Oscar initially sets themselves up as a rescuer to play hero for their team, but then there's a classic leap straight to victimship. As soon as Nadia approaches, she's cast as perpetrator, and Oscar gets the leap straight to being the victim. The transition of roles into victim is what gives Oscar his emotional payoff. And then the leap to uproar, where the roles are reversed, and Oscar is the righteous perpetrator, and Nadia the victim. Now, a game of uproar often follows from other games. Surging righteous anger is a tremendous emotional release and probably a bad sign if you're feeling it. It lets you enjoy the unfettered child experience of wielding that powerful emotion and the parent experience of punishment all at once. So beware that delightful feeling of being right with the urge to punish or feel superior. Your anger is not as rational as you think it probably is. In fact, indulging in uproar can leave you stunned as uproar can be contagious. You are all of you beneath me. I am a god, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. Puny god. Once someone's playing uproar, it's very easy for others to join in the throwing and shouting. The game we started with, with our two senior developers being idiots about code schools and text editors, is called Ain't It Awful. In this case, the game is for the participants exercising their critical parents whilst cursing basically everybody else. In terms of the drama triangle, both participants are the victim, persecuted by the easy life of the people they're complaining about. You see this game playing out in all sorts of places. Despairing articles in the media about millennial behavior, for example. 
genuine New York Times headline. Subscribe, everybody. Um, but this is not a new idea. It's been noted in writings from the time that older generations of Vikings would complain that the younger generation of Vikings were not murdering and pillaging with quite the same enthusiasm as they had back in their day. The best example of the ridiculousness of Ain't It Awful comes from my British compatriots, Monty Python. Would have thought 30 years ago we'd all be sitting here drinking Chateau de Chateau. Eh? Uh, them days we're glad to have the price of a cup of tea. Right, a cup of cold tea. Huh? Without milk or sugar. Or tea. In a cracked cup and all. Oh, we never used to have a cup. We used to have to drink out of a roll-up newspaper. The best we could manage was to suck on a piece of damp cloth. But you know, we were happy in those days, although we were poor. Because we were poor. Aye. My old dad used to say to me, money doesn't bring you happiness, son. He was right. Aye. I was happier then and I had nothing. We used to live in this tiny old tumble-down house with great big holes in the roof. <laughs> house? You were lucky to live in a house. We used to live in one room, all 26 of us, no furniture, half the floor was missing. We were all huddled together in one corner for fear of falling. You were lucky to have a room. We used to have to live in the corridor. Oh, we used to dream of living in a corridor. <laughs> Would have been a palace to us. We used to live in an old water tank on a rubbish tip. We got woke up every morning by having a load of rotting fish dumped all over us. House... <laughs> Well, when I say house, it was just a hole in the ground covered by a sheet of tarpaulin. But it was a house to us. We were evicted from our hole in the ground. We had to go and live in a lake. <laughs> you were lucky to have a lake. There were 150 of us living in a shoebox in the middle of the road. <laughs> Cardboard box. Aye, you were lucky. <laughs> we lived for three months in a rolled-up newspaper in a septic tank. <laughs> You used to have to get up every morning at 6 o'clock and clean the newspaper, go to work down the mill, 14 hours a day, week in, week out, for six months a week. And when we got home, our oh, dad would thrash us to sleep with his belt. Luxury. <laughs> we used to have to get out of the lake at 3 o'clock in the morning, clean the lake, eat a handful of hot gravel, work 20 hours a day at mill for twopence a month, come home and dad would beat us around the head and neck with a broken bottle if we were lucky. Well, of course, we had it tough. We used to have to get them out of the shoebox in the middle of the night and lick the road clean with our tongues. We had to eat half a handful of freezing cold gravel while 24 hours of that milk performance every six years and when we got home, our dad would slice us in two with a bread knife. Right. I had to get up in the morning at 10 o'clock at night, half an hour before I went to bed, eat a lump of cold poison, work 29 hours a day down mill and pay mill on for permission to come to work and when we got home, our dad would kill us and dance about in our grave, singing hallelujah. Oh. Are you try and tell the young people of today that? And they won't believe you. Oh, no, no, they won't. I recognise a little bit too much of myself in there. You might be feeling a bit shit. Like, you've seen these games. You've likely played these games. They're so predictable, there's a book from 1957 with a bunch of them written down, encoded, and humorously named. You might be thinking of specific conversations you keep having over and over and over and over and over. Andy, I hear you say. Andy, I hear you say. Good news is, you're already on your way. Like Neo in the Matrix, you're already seeing beneath the surface to the deeper experiences underneath. By listening to this today, you're already beginning to believe. This is what happened to me. I've had some therapy in the last year, and these concepts were introduced to me in terms of relationships between parents, children, spouses, and friends. Now, although I discovered this model in a personal context, the awareness of the games and the roles that we play in them was enough for me to start noticing them everywhere. Your brain doesn't know there's like a work-life boundary because there isn't. So you're as likely to see these games at work as you are in your close relationships. So well done on completing part one of our training. 
But what else is there? Perhaps nothing for me is pernicious in Facebook's culture and startups in general as move fast and break things. Ship the feature, fix the bug, learn this month's JavaScript framework. Get lost, Mark. That's surprisingly therapeutic. We are not encouraged in our industry to take a few precious moments. Well, unless... <laughs> so, given you're now aware these games are happening to you, or with you, you have a choice as to whether you want to continue to participate. But it's best not to learn to sail in a storm. You want it to be more like this. So take five minutes the next time you're tempted to rush into the easy embrace of a familiar conflict or mindset. And stop. I am giving you permission to take a fucking minute for yourselves. Now, over Christmas last year, I read a terrible book. <laughs> Genuinely, do not buy this book. <laughs> it is the worst kind of stretched out self-help pamphlet bullshit. It is life success cult guru nonsense. Are we clear? Do not buy this book. <laughs> now, the book is terrible, but the generic advice that is non-patentable is good. Take time to build mental health habits every day. Now, in my case, I sneak out of bed in the mornings before my wife and kids wake up. This is quite difficult, um, as I'm not a morning person, although given my time zone today is somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, it was much easier this morning. I do five to 10 minutes of Meditation using Headspace, and I do five minutes of journaling in an app called Day One. Like, it's just a brain dump of the previous day. It's not for anyone. It's not even for me, really. It's just long enough to get some perspective on any feelings or conflicts or things that happened the day before. Like, these two things, like total time, quarter of an hour, have had a tremendous effect on my overall calmness throughout the day, which lets me be a better adult when those difficult feelings or conflicts arise. Now, what's terrific is that these exercises have historical precedent. The little things I wake up and do are guided by 2,000-year-old Stoic principles. The Stoics had tons of useful rational takes of the troubles of the modern human. Seneca said we're more, fr more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more from imagination than reality. Like, if that doesn't describe the search for victimhood in the Dryama Triangle, I don't know what does. So Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor and fellow Stoic essayist, had the solution. Which is like, you have power over your own mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. Like, it's only by looking at ourselves that we can break out of the irrational, damaging patterns in Eric Byrne's games. Like, this advice is not even from 2,000 years ago. This is a like 6,000-year-old quote. And if you're looking for the cliff notes, it's even being examined into a 22-minute sitcom on NBC, which is where I heard the last quote. But genuinely, pick up a copy of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. It remains readable and is full of good ways to think about the world. Thinking about this stuff and understanding the games and each party's motivations in them lets your adult be a better arbiter and a better arbiter of the impulses that you're getting from your child and your parent. Like, I want to be clear, this is not about removing your positive and negative emotions and making you some sort of crazy, well, not, not crazy, making you some sort of emotionless automaton. It's about understanding your internal parental and child-like voices and seeing them only as inputs into how you end up behaving and taking care of yourself. Like, if you're maintaining an adult psychological reality, you don't need to chase the role of victim, and you can abandon the drama triangle altogether. You're always going to have emotional reactions, and you should because you're not a robot, but you should be able to examine them and encourage your elephant to do less harm to yourself and less harm to others. Not necessarily in the moment every time, but afterwards. Humans have grand visions of our own importance, and this is particularly true of software engineers. We view ourselves as rational, making measured arguments and having considered ideas about politics, morals, tabs, spaces. But we're not rational. Being aware of these things makes you a better collaborator, teammate, manager, partner, parent, and human. Code is rational, software can be right. But so many of us lean towards writing software because we thought this, and that the human bits were too hard, too messy. Indulging in the comforting thought that we're more rational than other people is a fallacy. 
Software is a team sport. Software is made of people, made by people. Watch out for these games everywhere, examining your overpowering feelings, find space to take care of yourself, and may you lead a drama. We protect our little fictions like it's all